Very uh, For those of us who kind of wonder how he ended up here, uh, he was doing his master's. And there was no way he was going to continue in CEE. <laughs> uh, no. He's getting fed up. Okay? And it is fortunate that he, this is all his story, so I'm not bragging. But he took the class called, C, which is now called CE 209. Uh, and he said, This is it. I found what I want to do. I want to do a PhD <laughs> in this topic, in this area. That's now. Certainly makes sense. Civil engineering is the thing I want to do. So there he is. Uh, besides his uh, accomplishments in in going very deep into geochemistry and and the dynamics of how molecular aggregates form and how ions affect the aggregation of of uh, these how molecules molecules affect the aggregation of these aggregates. Uh, he is also a semi-national champion in skateboarding and snowboarding. <laughs> so don't think you have to give your life away if you have to do a PhD, right? And you can do that stuff as well. <laughs> and he is the only graduate student ever in the entire history of this international highest prize called Prince Sultan Abu Aziz Water Prize, P C W in water ever to have won uh, on that in that prize. And this is the this is the prize run by the folks in Abu Dhabi. Uh, no, yeah, it's, it's, it's the Abu Dhabi prize. And and uh, pretty exclusive. We beat out teams from Stanford and MIT to win it. And everybody else of course just is faculty members and, and with PhDs and here is a graduate student on the winning team. First one ever. So with that, case. Right. <laughs> um, I don't know if I can add much to that, uh, other than I'm, I'm very happy to be here presenting uh, for you guys part of my dissertation work on the interaction of oxyanines and bivalent cations during iron depolymerization. Um, so getting started with the acknowledgments. Let's see here. Okay. Oh man, that's a bad place. All right. So <laughs> the, the acknowledgments. Um, this is part of a, a, a larger group group work um, encompassing several universities. I, I'd like to take a moment to thank the Synchrotron Beamline support staff. Um, I don't think they get nearly as much credit. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about the Synchrotron later in the talk and the, um, the funding bodies that fund, funded my work. Okay, so the outline for the talk, I'm, I'm first going to introduce um, arsenic as a problem. That'll be really brief. And then also the technology that we're working on. And then I'll talk a little bit about the object, objectives and the hypotheses of the work. Uh, and then I'm going to start um, with describing the methods and the results of our macroscopic techniques. We're going to start from a really large scale, or the largest scale, and we're going to work our way down into the molecular scale techniques. And so I'll be describing both the methods and the results macroscopically and then microscopically. And we're working our way up to developing structural models that describe the interaction between oxyanions and bivalent cations in our system. And then I'll finish by talking a little bit about the implications of this work for um, for arsenic removal in the field. Okay, so arsenic, naturally occurring arsenic contamination is a, it's a, really it's a worldwide problem. We have it in the Central Valley, um, but we also have centralized water treatment. So um, it's pretty easy to remove there. Uh, where it happens to be one of the, the largest um, problems is in rural South Asia. So the, the entire Bengal Basin, and that encompasses the entire country of Bangladesh and parts of Northeast India. Uh, where population, population density is, is very high um, and you have really high naturally occurring arsenic concentrations and there's very little resources, very little infrastructure. So uh, ingesting arsenic contaminated water uh, for a long time eventually leads to cancer um, and this problem has been going on for decades and so it's been called the largest mass poisoning in human history. So the, the technology that we are developing um, it's called the, uh, the electrolytic dissolution of iron electrodes. In the literature, it's called electrocoagulation. Um, and there's, there's several properties of 
this technique that we think will make it amenable to sustainable operation in the field. Uh, so it's extremely low cost, it's very efficient at removing arsenic, and it's very easily scalable, so to treat more water, you just get bigger electrodes or a bigger tank. Um, and I think one of the most important things, uh, at least in my opinion, opinion, is that everything that goes into the technology is locally available and locally affordable. So what we do is we start with zero valent iron, so sheets of iron, iron is ubiquitous, it's very easy to find. And we insert them into, uh, insert these electrodes into pumped groundwater. And we attach uh, a small electric current to the electrodes and that uh, rapidly corrodes the electrode producing iron 2. Iron 2 is oxidized <laughs> to iron 3. Um, and iron 3 is insoluble so it polymerizes into an iron oxide precipitate in the presence of co-occurring ions. So I'm, I'm primarily concerned with this, uh, this technology in, in terms of uh, as an engineered system for removing arsenic, but a lot of the technical processes that happen during this during the treatment um, also occur in natural systems. So, for example, uh, natural redox boundaries in soils and sediments, <coughs> hyperbaric zones in lakes, um, where anywhere where you get uh, anoxic groundwater um, oxidized or open to the atmosphere, you have iron two oxidizing into iron three precipitates. <coughs> so, another benefit of this technology is that. By controlling the current, we can control the rate of iron 2 production. And that's, that's a very important uh, part of this technology because it allows us to optimize the extent of side reactions that occur during iron 2 oxidation. So when iron 2 is oxidized by dissolved oxygen, you produce very powerful, very strong oxidants, which can oxidize arsenic 3 to arsenic 5, and arsenic 5 is uh, much more easily removed. <clears throat> so our group has done uh, quite a bit of work on that. Uh, but for the purpose of this talk, really the, the technical process that I'm going to focus on mostly is that we're generating iron essentially one atom at a time, and we're generating iron precipitates in the presence of these co-occurring ions. And so groundwater doesn't just contain arsenic, it contains silicate, phosphate, calcium, magnesium. And it's the interaction of these oxyanions, like what I'm showing here, arsenic is is in red, phosphate in green, silica is in blue. Um, it's the interaction of oxyanions uh, with bivalent cations that can change the structure and reactivity of, of iron oxides. And that ultimately governs the performance of EC systems in the field. EC is electrocoagulation. <clears throat> so the idea is that if we can better understand how oxyanions and bivalent cations interact, we can make better predictions of how this is going to work in the field, and in a more broader sense, we'll be able to understand the fate and bioavailability of contaminants and nutrients in natural systems. Okay, so the objective for this for this work is to investigate the structure and reactivity of iron free precipitates generated by electrocoagulation in the presence of um, oxyanions and bivalent cations, and, and try to characterize that interaction. And what we expect to see is that relative to a single solute system, meaning um, a system that has just phosphate or just arsenate, uh, when in combination with the bivalent cation, that's gonna change the structural effects and the uptake behavior uh, of the oxyanion. And so these, these, com these combined electrolytes, you can call them binary electrolytes if you like, uh, they're, they're likely a more representative electrolyte than working in a single solute model system. Okay, so the approach is to generate iron oxides using iron electrocoagulation in systematically varied electrolytes. <clears throat> so uh, we generate half a millimole of iron, so 500 micromoles of iron, um, at an iron dosage rate of 50 micromoles uh, per minute, 50 micromoles of iron per minute. And the <laughs> electrolytes that we're varying, uh, we, we're looking at a, a, a wide range of oxyanion concentrations going from 50 micromoles to 500 micromoles, both arsenic 5 and phosphate. And in the purpose of, of, of for this presentation, uh, we're only going to look at either in the absence of calcium or in the presence of one millimole of calcium, one millimolar calcium. Um, so going forward, when I talk about the different samples, uh, the, the IDs that I'm going to be using are going to be the initial electrolyte composition. So if the initial, if the initial electrolyte contained 500 micromoles of arsenic and one millimole of calcium, that sample is going to be called AS500 plus calcium. Alright, anything else here? I think that's it. 
Okay, so the, the typical batch experiments that we, that we run, we apply the current for 10 minutes and generate half a millimole of iron um, at neutral, circumneutral pH, uh, and then we allow all of the reactions to occur for two hours open to the atmosphere. And so we take an, an aliquot of this suspension and measure turbidity before and after one hour of settling, and then we filter all of the, um, the solids using 0 0.1 or 0 0.45 micron filters, and then we measure <coughs> ion uptake with ICP-OES. Then we take the filtered solids finally for this molecular scale characterization that I'll, the characterization that I'll be talking about later. Okay, so the, the first of the data, again, this is the, the really the most macroscopic measurement that, that we've made, um, it's these turbidity measurements. So in the absence of calcium, uh, this P150 and AS150 samples, we see that there's a lower initial turbidity, and, and that's due to uh, colloidal stability. So these, essentially these suspensions look translucent, and they don't settle at nearly any kind of um, uh, practical time scale. So these, these kinds of precipitates actually pose a problem in field treatment because it's very difficult to remove colloidally stable precipitates from treated, from treated water at low cost. Um, and in the field right now we use, we use alum, but um, I'll be talking a little bit about that at the very end of the talk. <clears throat> so in the presence of calcium, on the other hand, you generate uh, a suspension with, with much higher initial turbidity, and that's because calcium aggregates these particles. Um, and these particles then settle really quickly. So the initial turbidity is higher, um, but the final turbidity is lower. So calcium promotes particle aggregation. All right, so now what I'm, what I'm showing here uh, is, is the um, batch uptake experiments. On the y-axis, we have percent removal of either phosphate, arsenate, or calcium as a function of initial oxyanion concentration. <clears throat> so getting started with, with this red graph, or this red plot right here, arsenic in the absence of calcium, at the lowest initial arsenic concentration, you get pretty, pretty much full removal, but the percent removal drops as the initial concentration grows. And now if I, if I were to plot phosphate in the absence of calcium, it would follow in a, the exact same trend. So arsenic in the presence, arsenic removal in the presence of calcium, you get much more arsenic removed per mass of iron. So remember that in all of these experiments, we use the same amount of iron. So arsenic removal is enhanced in the presence of calcium, and that's our first indication that there might be an interaction between calcium and arsenic. <clears throat> but this interaction is going to be weaker than the phosphate-calcium interaction. So you he see here that at every single initial phosphate concentration, we get nearly full removal. And so we can cal calculate the solids ratio for all of these samples. And for this sample in particular, we're looking at about one, uh, a solids ratio of one phosphorus atom per iron atom. So it's an extremely high solids ratio. So in the open squares, I'm plotting calcium removal. And you can see that calcium removal increases with initial arsenic concentration. And calcium removal, if I were to plot it, for, um, in the phosphate system, calcium removal would be even higher. Okay, so um, so keep in mind that these, all of these, all right. So all of the the last. Can we do gap on this? Um, yeah, it's working now. We're good. So all of these experiments, um, we the reaction the mixing stage was two hours, and so um, in these experiments we're going to look at all of those data points um, with a, a little bit more detail here. And so what I'm plotting is aqueous arsenic as a function of time throughout the electrolysis and mixing stage. And the mixing stage actually ends, ends at like two hours, like way over here. Um, but uh, we can see that arsenic is essentially depleted at about 20 minutes. So keep in mind that the electrolysis stage is 10 minutes, so throughout this part we're still generating iron. So what, the, what this is telling us is that the majority of iron in this sample, this arsenic-50 sample, is generated in the presence of arsenic-5. When you add calcium at the same arsenic concentration, you have a rapid depletion here. And so about four minutes into the electrolysis, the electrolyte is essentially free of arsenic-5, and it, it looks like a, a background electrolyte, something like sodium chloride. So that, that means that the majority of iron generated in this sample, this AS50 AS plus calcium sample, is generated in an electrolyte that has no arsenic in it. So we expect a different phase to form here than here. 
And this, in the literature, this is called the sequential formation of iron-3 precipitates. And I'll be using that term a lot um, going through the talk. So we expect that the solids generated here have a really large sorption capacity for arsenic. And then the solids generated here are going to be crystalline because there's no arsenic in solution. So increasing the arsenic concentration, uh, we see that for this sample, AS150 plus calcium, um, the majority of iron is generated in the presence of arsenic-5 because arsenic isn't depleted until about 10 minutes in. So for the phosphate concentration... Um, so for the phosphate concentration series, uh, we see that phosphate is depleted even um, with, which, with less iron required than in the arsenic concentration series. And that's consistent with our batch uptake experiments as well. <clears throat> so since in this technique we control the current, um, we, uh, we know very precisely how much iron we've added into the system. And so at this largest phosphate concentration, we can actually calculate the solids ratio from... Yes, there it is. Uh, going from here to here, in two minutes, the solids that are generated here have a solids ratio of about one phosphorus atom for one iron atom. And that's exactly what we see in this sample here. So we expect that these samples can serve as a good approximation. The, the uh, structure of these samples can serve as a good approximation for the structure of the samples that are formed here at the onset of electrolysis. <coughs> so these are, these are going to be uh, very disordered particles. They're going to have an extremely um, high affinity for, uh, for binding arsenic and phosphate. And these are going to be the reactive solids. And then the solids that are generated here uh, are going to be less reactive. That's what we would expect. And so consistent with uh, that idea, this is a, a transmission electron microscope image of the AS50 plus calcium sample where we would expect multiple phases. And we see two different morphologies. We see one morphology here, which is this needle-like platelet. Uh, which is consistent with uh, uh, an iron oxide, oxyhydroxide called epitoprocyte, interspersed in a bunch of aggregated spheres. Um, and these aggregated spheres are the ones that we expect are going to be uh, very good at removing arsenic and phosphate. So at the larger, um, the larger initial arsenic concentration, uh, we see much less uh, needle-like platelets, and we see a pretty homogeneous um, aggregate here. And we can zoom in on one of these aggregates and we see that they're composed of primary particles that are extremely small. And again, these primary particles are going to have an extremely high surface area and they're going to be extremely reactive. Alright, so now that we have a good idea about kind of the, the, the macroscopic picture of, of what's happening in the system, we can start to we can start to uh, approach the, the chemical bonds that are happening in our system. So we know that arsenic and phosphate and calcium, they're, they're being taken up by the oxide. We want to understand how they're being taken up and, and the strength of the bonds that are formed. So what we're doing here is, is we're using chemicals to probe the strength of these of the bonds. Um, so in, in this approach, we filter the solids and leave the solids on the filter, filter membrane, and then we pass a series of solutions through. So that, uh, which are designed to target different kinds of ions. So the DI water targets entrained ions, and what I mean by that is, is ions that are just not really associated with the oxide, but more stuck in the pore spaces, for example. So this is kind of like rinsing it. Then we pass one molar sodium chloride, and that's designed to target weakly sorbed ions, so something like uh, an outer sphere complex, for example. And then we put the entire filtered solids and digest them in oxalic acid, and that dissolves um, the iron oxide. So this is going to be targeting all the, the really strongly sorbed ions. All right. So <clears throat> on the left, I'm plotting here the fraction of mobilized arsenic or phosphate. Um, and you can see the three different steps up here. But you see that it's very clear arsenic and phosphate are only mobilized in the oxalic acid step. And if I were to plot iron, the fraction mobilized iron, you would see the exact same trend. And so that's telling us that there's a very strong coupling between arsenic and iron, or phosphorus and iron in our system. And that the, the mobilization of arsenic um, is primarily contingent on the dissolution of the, of the solid phase, at least in these experiments. Calcium, on the other hand, um, is mobilized uh, both in the sodium chloride step and in the oxalic acid step. But there's a trend that 
uh, calcium retained after the sodium chloride step increases with increasing oxyanide. <clears throat> so you see that trend here. Um, and just uh, co consistent with, our, with um, most of our other data, we see that this interaction between phosphorus and calcium uh, is stronger in the phosphate series than it is for the arsenic series. <clears throat> so there's more, there's more strongly sorbed calcium in the phosphate series than the arsenic series. And so what this allows us to do is we can, uh, we can kind of call, we can separate calcium into two different, uh, two different types of calcium, we'll say. Um, one is the type of calcium that's uh, removed in this, in this sodium chloride step, which is going to be uh, weakly sorbed, and I'll call that electrostatic calcium going forward. And then the other type of calcium is the strongly sorbed calcium that hangs around after the sodium chloride step, and I'll be calling that structural calcium. Okay, so uh, before I get into the molecular scale approaches that I'm using, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about iron oxides in general. Uh, so one of the, the reasons that iron, iron oxides are so reactive is because they have a very small particle size, but that makes them notoriously difficult to characterize using traditional approaches like X-ray diffraction or electron microscopy. <clears throat> so two-line ferrohydrite is, is a reference mineral that um, people use a lot to describe, to use uh, to model um, nanoparticulate iron oxyhydroxides, and it's been the subject of considerable research. Uh, Lipidic crocyte is an iron oxyhydroxide uh, that, when you compare it to two lent ferrohydrite, is pretty well behaved. All of the atoms are where they're supposed to be. It's a very ordered and crystalline material, and we've known the structure of that for decades. And this is because we can use x ray diffraction to look at this, but we can't use x ray diffraction to look at this one because it's too disordered and it's too small. So that forces us to use non traditional techniques. And in my case, I use uh, synchrotron-based X-ray characterization techniques. Now, um, this is kind of uh, this is one of the more unique things I think about about my dissertation work is that I spend a lot of time at particle ac accelerators and synchrotrons. Uh, synchrotrons are these gigantic user facilities that are attached to particle accelerators that give the user access to X-rays with very high flux and very specific energies. <clears throat> and users can then use those x-rays and they can uh, measure the interaction of the x-ray with matter uh, to derive structural information that would otherwise be impossible to get from, say, lab x-ray diffraction. Um, I'm plotting three of the synchrotrons that I've used um, in my dissertation work. So we actually have two in the Bay Area. We have one at LBL and we have one at Stanford. Um, there's a, a relatively new synchrotron in Chicago. It's a really fantastic place. And then I've also used one in, in the northeast of Switzerland at the Paul Scherer Institute. <clears throat> so I, I always have trouble kind of um, explaining what entails a, a, a synchrotron experiment because um, there's like they, they look really nice from outside, like these, you know these big storage rings. But once you get in there, there's just Equipment, you could say there's crap everywhere. There's equipment everywhere, and like everything is covered in tin foil, and it looks like the inside of a spaceship or something. Um, and so the first time you go there, it's it's very intimidating about like how much junk there is in there. Uh, and you know these pictures are, are pretty bad, but yeah, I don't really have one that gives like the majesty of the of the synchrotron. But there's just stuff everywhere. And the way that they give you time is you write a proposal and it's, it's rated by a proposal committee and they assign to you um, a rating and then you ask for beam time on a specific beam line and depending on the rating, you'll, you'll get time. But the way that they give you time is in gigantic chunks because say they were going to give you 12 hours or something like that. It might take 11 and a half hours to set up an experiment because you've got to calibrate the beam, you've got to position it right, you have to make sure that the samples are, are placed in the right spot, um, and then you have one hour of, of actual time. So they actually give you chunks of anywhere from 40 to, to 80 hours or something like that. So the longest I've ever had was 64 hours. And the expectation is that if you have that time, you, are, you had better be running experiments because it's very difficult to get time on these, on these user facilities. So that means 
that if you are there by yourself, you are staying up for 64 hours. And I did that once. Like 40 hours is okay. I, I kind of figured it out at the end. But the 64 hour one, I was going crazy. So it's, it's, a, it's a weird, I, I don't know what else to say about it. Like the, the time that they give you, you had, you had better use it properly. Um, and that means staying up for hours and hours and hours and hours. Okay, so um, let's see here. Like I said, it's a pretty intimidating place. All right, and, uh, and so the, the first time that you go, you don't really know what's going on. And this picture right here is one of the first times that I went. I was so scared I was going to touch something and break it because everything there can, you can move around. Like this whole setup, you can take it out. Like you can unscrew everything. Everything can, can move around, and you can pretty much break everything too. It's like a disaster waiting to happen. Um, and here, this, this picture of me is um, I'm pouring liquid nitrogen onto the sample chamber. Um, after staying up for the, you know, like 63 hours or something like that. And, and right below where I'm pouring this liquid nitrogen, it's not just expensive equipment, it's really expensive equipment. And there's actually a button right here that if you press it, even on accident, it's there for like safety. Um, but if you press it, <laughs> the entire particle accelerator stops. So everybody, everybody that's there with you, Who's, who's on a different beam line loses data, not just you. The whole thing, the whole accelerator shuts down, and then the local authorities get contacted, and then people that live in the vicinity of one of these are like, why are you guys being so unsafe and stopping the beam? And so it can have like really dramatic repercussions. In any case, all joking aside... Um, you did not press the button. <laughs> uh, these, these synchrotrons have really revolutionized the way that environmental chemists uh, look at mineral formation um, and sorption reactions in, in complex systems. So two of the techniques that I'm going to be talking about primarily are the pair distribution function and X-ray absorption spectroscopy. So uh, both of these techniques give kind of complementary information um, in the form of a distribution of, ato of interatomic distances. So you have a peak where two atoms um, well, we can see what the data looks like. But the, the PDF is not element specific. It sees every single atom within the solid. So if you're looking for something that's dilute, say arsenic at the lowest concentration in our samples, you would use X-ray absorption spectroscopy because it is element specific. But the problem with XAS is that it cannot see atoms past about six angstroms. So you're limited to the really the local protonation environment of arsenic. So it can only see what it's around for six angstroms. Um, the PDF sees every single atom within the structure. All right. So as an example, I'm, I'm showing the PDF of two-line ferrohydrite, which again is that reference mineral that um, people like to talk about in the literature. And you can see it, uh, a distribution of peaks that correspond to interatomic distances. And this first peak is iron oxygen. These two peaks here are iron iron. And you can actually index all of these peaks. Uh, and I put an arrow here to highlight another property of the PDF that's really important, at least to my work, is that when these peaks die out, when they decay to zero, that's an, that gives you a good approximation for the extent of the particles. That, that's the crystallite diameter there. Once there's no more peaks, there's no more atoms. So where the peaks die out is, the, is an approximation of the, of the size of the particle. Okay, so this is going to be like really the only structural data part. I hope people don't fall asleep here, but it's going to be real fast. So um, here's lipidocrosite again, and that's uh, the, the crystalline iron oxyhydroxide um, that is composed of edge sharing sheets that are stacked on top of each other. And then on the bottom here is two line ferrohydrate. And these minerals are going to be the end members of our data set. So all of our data pretty much fall in between here. So in our simplest system, something like sodium chloride, an electrolyte that has no strongly sorbing oxyanions, uh, we get lipidocrosite. And that's this blue, I highlighted the fingerprint for lipidocrosite in blue and the fingerprint for ferrohydrite in green. And you, you can notice that there's some deviation in the line shape, especially with this, with this peak here at 8.6 angstroms. And that's actually because in our system, when we generate um, our most crystalline material, we generate, we generate lipidocrosite with poor sheet stacking order, meaning that there's only a few uh, of these edge sharing sheets stacked on top of each other. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so when, uh, at the lowest 
initial arsenic concentration is 50 micromolar to arsenic concentration, you get something that looks like ferrohydrate again. And here's the green thing. It was depleted four minutes into electrolysis, and you have the majority of iron being generated in an electrolyte with no aqueous arsenic. And so that's why we see a lipidocrosite here. Um, this is actually multi-phase, which we saw from the TEM images, but the PDF probes the average structure, and so we, that's why we see this lipidocrosite line shape again. At the um, increasing the arsenic concentration, both in the presence and absence of calcium, we get uh, ferrohydrate-like material, and here's these three peaks that we see in ferrohydrate. And now at the highest arsenic concentration, um, these samples are actually pretty interesting, so I'm going to zoom in on these. <clears throat> especially arsenic 500 plus calcium and P500 plus calcium, the peaks die out at about seven angstroms or so. And that's, I mean, that is incredibly small. And that, that means that these samples are, you can only really describe these as polymers. And they have extremely large surface area and extremely high arsenic or phosphorus solids ratios. And so we can index some of these peaks here. This is arsenic oxygen, iron oxygen, calcium oxygen, arsenic iron in the arsenic sample. And then in the phosphate sample, we can index the peaks again, but we see this peak here showing up. Um, and if you remember from the mobilization data in, in this sample, we had the majority of calcium was associated to this with this solid and strongly sorbing um, surface complexes. So, Strongly sorbing calcium would show up more than electrostatic calcium in using the PDF. And so this peak right here, this shoulder, uh, the position of that peak is exactly where it is um, in calcium phosphate minerals, like hydroxyl apatite. And so we expect this shoulder here to be due to calcium and phosphorus. But we argue against um, the formation of a distinct calcium phosphate mineral because if this were due to a distinct calcium phosphate mineral, we would see peaks from it going further out, but we, but we don't. We see that after about seven angstroms, there's nothing. Okay, so the last thing that we're gonna look at, nice. okay, um, is we're gonna look at, we're gonna use X-ray absorption spectroscopy to look at what surrounds arsenic in our system. And so here's a, a few possible configurations. There's several more where you have structural calcium, electrostatic calcium, and arsenic here. Um, and what we want to do is start to rule some of these out. <clears throat> so here we have, again, um, a series of, of peaks that correspond to the interatomic distance between atoms. And at the very top, I'm showing scorodite. And scorodite is an iron arsenic mineral. Um, and the first <coughs> peak here, corresponds to arsenic oxygen, and you can see that this peak in scorodite is similar to the peak in our samples, and we would expect that for arsenic-5. But the second shell peak, this peak here, um, in scorodite is the position. The position is shifted, and of course the amplitude is much higher. And this is because in scorodite, arsenic is actually incorporated into a crystal structure. And so arsenic sees much more iron atoms in this incorporate in, in a crystal than it does um, when it's absorbed to something. And so that explains why you see a much larger amplitude here. Okay, so all of um, the remaining spectra are all of our samples. And uh, it's pretty easy to see that all of our samples look pretty similar. And so um, regardless of the presence or absence of calcium and the initial arsenic concentration. And so we can actually model this second shell peak um, using X-ray absorption spectroscopy software. And uh, the fits that we get, we have th this peak here, all of these peaks can all be described, or uh, yeah, they can all be described by uh, an arsenic coordination geometry with an arsenic iron interatomic distance of 3.28 angstroms and an arsenic iron coordination number of two, which is consistent with this configuration here. Arsenic-5 bound primarily in this 2C corner sharing geometry. And in fact, um, this is the primary uh, arsenic coordination geometry to iron oxyhydroxides that's reported in the literature. So we can then go back to our possible configurations and we can rule these two out. So we're probably gonna have th this one and this one are both possible based on our data and we actually expect both of these to occur in our system. So now, taking everything that we have 
all of the data that we've got, all of these constraints from the different techniques that we're using, both macroscopic and molecular scale, we can come up with possible uh, structural models um, of these polymers that form at the onset of electrolysis. And so for the, uh, this, this sample is going to be derived from data from the AS500 plus calcium sample. And in this model, calcium uh, enhances arsenic uptake in two ways. So one, electrostatic calcium uh, neutralizes surface charge. So arsenic uh, is uh, negatively charged at neutral pH, and um, calcium is positively charged, and so calcium associating with these polymeric sub subunits neutralizes the surface charge and minimizes long-range repulsive forces from arsenic coming onto the iron oxide and binding. <clears throat> and structural calcium uh, enhances arsenic uptake by forming chemical bonds. Okay, so the phosphate 500, or the P500 plus calcium, sample is here, and really the only difference between the two is that in this sample you have a much larger fraction of, of strongly sorbed or structural calcium. And so that's what we see here. All right. So now we can go back to our TEM images and we can really pin down the, the atomic scale configuration of both of these phases. So here this, this needle-like platelet is lipidocrosite with um, just a few coherently stacked sheets, and then this really small particle is, is an aggregate of these polymeric iron oxyhydroxides that have a really large uh, oxyanine solids ratio. All right, so now one of the last things we can do is, is the implications of this work is we can, um, we can make much better predictions of how this technique will work in uh, electrolytes with different chemical compositions. And so I'm plotting two or uh, I'm showing two, um, an example of two different uh, groundwater aquifers, and they have distinctly different groundwater compositions, especially with respect to um, these bivalent cations. So the aquifer in Bangladesh has a high concentration of calcium and magnesium, and the um, aquifer in Argentina has a lower concentration. And so we can begin to start to, to be able to predict how, uh, how EC is going to work in these, in these um, electrolytes. So the first thing is that regardless of the presence or absence of calcium, the sequential formation of iron precipitates is going to be important. At the onset of electrolysis, we're going to generate particles that have a really high oxyanion to iron, oxyanion to iron ratio. Um, but uh, in the case with low calcium magnesium, we're going to have to generate much more iron because the sorption capacity of these polymeric uh, iron oxyhydroxides is going to be lower in the absence of calcium and magnesium. Okay, um, in the absence of calcium and magnesium, colloidal, um, colloidal stability is going to be a problem. Uh, so, for example, in, in this groundwater from Argentina with a low calcium and magnesium concentration, uh, we're going to have to uh, do a little bit of work to optimize the amount of alum that we're adding to aggregate the particles. Okay, I didn't really talk about silica at all. Um, th this presentation just focused on ca uh, calcium, arsenic, and phosphate, but phosphate. But this is part of a larger uh, project looking at silica as well. Um, and you can see that silica is at, at a pretty high concentration in both aquifers, and that's pretty common in groundwater. So uh, what silica does is, during the sequential formation of iron oxides, you get these polymeric sample or polymeric precipitates at the beginning. And then instead of forming lipidocrosite, you're going to form uh, another poorly ordered material. And that's because silica binds in the same areas as um, arsenic and phosphate, but it's, uh, arsenic and phosphate have a stronger affinity for binding. So silica is going to really control the average structure. Okay, and one more um, caveat is that in uh, groundwaters that are near super satur saturation with respect to calcium carbonate, you might have uh, calcite forming that strongly associates with the iron oxide and that can block surface sites on the precipitate. Okay, last slide, right? Oh no, conclusions. So really quickly, calcium promotes aggregation, it enhances arsenic and phosphate uptake for massive iron. Um, and the sequential formation of the iron precipitates is going to be uh, influenced by the presence of calcium. Uh, strongly sorbed calcium increases with increasing initial oxyanion concentration. 
and the um, coordination geometry of arsenic isn't really influenced by the presence of calcium, and we have it bound primarily in that um, 2C corner string geometry. Okay, last slide here is just a few stats from, from my dissertation. I ended up spending 468 hours at, at the Beamline, and they keep very good stats about that. Uh, I removed about seven and a half million micrograms of arsenic. <laughs> which sounds, I mean, that sounds a lot better than like seven and a half grams, but seven and a half million <laughs> micrograms. <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty toxic too, so EHNS had, had a lot of work to do because of me. Um, I, I, there was 240 usable tests that I, that I used. Uh, I don't know how many unusable experiments I did, but that number is probably a lot higher. I lived in eight different apartments and one farmhouse. Got the weird, like nomadic lifestyle going, I guess. I needed uh, five research-related visas to go to different spots. I think all, all told, it was like 12 countries or something like that. I only missed one plane flight, and Ashok didn't know this, and I only lost one passport. And but it all worked out. I made it back just fine. Add all of that stuff together, and you get one silly little dissertation. <laughs> and I think that's it. That's a good point, and so uh, typically it's it's frowned upon to collect data on the same sample because the time is so sought after that if you're getting data for the same thing, then it's a problem. But there are um, it's the, depending on the technique. Each technique is is uh, it has. Let's see. It's, it's good at different things. So X-ray absorption spectroscopy is, in, is very good at detecting the distance between atoms, but it can't detect that coordination number very well. So um, it's and that that has to do with the exact equation, which is in, in, in this talk. Um, so the error on coordination number that you derive from modeling the peak is is typically at least 20%. I would say. Depending if the data quality is poor, it can be much much higher than that. But the the error on the interatomic distance is 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 minimal. It's very good at doing that. Uh, the how we use the PDF in in this in this work is um, like we index the peaks a little bit, but we use the interatomic distance where the peaks tend to die out. Uh, we use that in some of the con, in, in some of the model constraints, um, and of course there's there's uh, probably some some variability because we're just using our eye to do that. Uh, but I think for for this work, um, I think we have a pretty conservative estimate on it. Uh, there's one of the biggest problems with the PDF technique is that um, like quantitative modeling hasn't really been it's not very well documented. Uh, so we use the PDF in, in mostly to visually interpret and compare it with reference minerals. So I didn't do any kind of analysis where I looked at the repeatability in measuring different um, structures, but for X-ray absorption spectroscopy, uh, you take multiple scans of one, of one sample and then you average them together. Awesome, thank you. Um, you talked a lot about the sequential formation of the iron oxides, and I'm wondering, uh, it seems like all of that sort of derives from the fact that you have a batch reactor. Okay, yep. And so first, my question is, is that true? And secondly, as this technology goes to scale, isn't a continuous flow reactor more appropriate, and how does that change sort of the applicability of this work to large scale? Okay, you? yes, those are, those are both, <laughs> both good questions. So... Um, you know, when we talk about work in the field, probably one difference between my work and work, work in the field is that I wasn't really concerned with getting the arsenic concentration below a certain level. And so 
in the field, we want the arsenic concentration to be you know, 10 micrograms per liter, right? Less than that. Uh, so in my work, I, I overdosed quite a bit. Um, but if, if we were to use this in a, a continuous flow, um, I think it, it certainly is going to, we're going to have to do a little bit more work on how my results can apply to that. Because I think the ultimately the, the structure of the oxide isn't going to be the same. Um, so w one good thing about the, the way that we have, the way that we're designing the reactor now is that <clears throat> when we generate iron oxides in the presence of oxyanines, we, get, we, we have so much efficiency gain in the amount of oxyanine we can remove per mass of iron than we would, say, if, if we generated an, an oxide and then used it in a filter column or something like that. Um, yeah. Is that good enough? That's good enough. <laughs> That's good enough for your last day. <laughs> the other question I had is, you talked about when the peaks sort of level out, yeah, that, yeah. that speaks to something about the particle size, but I would think that would speak to something about the long range order in the crystal okay. structure. Absolutely, absolutely. And so I didn't, you know, I, I didn't make that distinction in this talk, but okay. you're absolutely right. So what that, um, what that measures is the coherent scattering domains. That's the extent of coherently scattering atoms in the structure. Mm -hmm. And what that doesn't account for is aggregation. So in some of these samples, like when I showed the AS500, maybe I can go back to it. So you're, you're absolutely right. You know, when you write up this work, um, you have to be very specific about the language that you use when you talk about it. So I, I mean, I just use particle size here because um, I didn't really want to get into the nitty gritty about it. I think it was a lot in the early slide, but you can go back. Uh, it was the end there also. I think one more. Okay, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Like the coherent scattering domain is what you measure with the PDF, and that necessarily doesn't necessarily translate to the larger aggregates that we see macroscopically with like a turbidity measurement or something like that. So this is a perfect slide because it's perfectly related to my question. I understand um, how the electrostatic calcium will improve the uptake of arsenic or phosphate yeah. by shielding it with electrostatic compulsion. Uh -huh. But how about the structural calcium? Like this picture, I don't see how it increases the phosphate uptake. Okay, so it, it actually does exactly what electrostatic calcium is doing, but it does it much better. Okay. So in addition, okay, so you have this, so for example, this subunit here is gonna have, is gonna be more positively charged than like this one is here. Okay. Um, the other thing is that when you have direct covalent or like, you know, covalent type bonding, um, that's usually a much stronger interaction than electrostatic. Right? And so you can actually, in this slide, you actually see that there's more spots for arsenic to bind to as well. Right? Because calcium arsenic can bind to calcium here and here. And then like the, the oxide is, is by itself. And here there's no arsenic actually forming a bond. But did you see an actually calcium bond in your data? Uh, on the for... Data. No. So that, that's <laughs> why, I mean, we're looking at phosphorus here. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, okay. Yeah, we did. Okay. Yeah, that's what I assume that, that corner sharing, or that um, that shoulder at 3.6 inch is. Any further questions? Thank you once again. Perfect timing too, look at that. I know. <laughs> <laughs>